Hey everyone, I'm going to be talking to you today about Smith's chapter 2, about the church. Smith's main thesis for this chapter is that Christian worship has a political emphasis as we build society and practices around the kingdom of God. He believes that we're continually being shaped by the world in which we live, even if we don't recognize it. So worship must not be a private hiding from society, but a public renunciation of idols that exist in our current settings. Smith claims that the gospel itself is a sort of liberation narrative from the rival kingdoms of the world that seek our loyalty. The world proclaims that Jesus Christ is Lord, not Caesar, anyone, or anything else. And instead of viewing this life as a placeholder for the one to come, Smith calls the church to action now to teach and model ethics and justice that stem from the biblical narrative. The church's primary avenue for doing this, in Smith's opinion, this instruction is worship. Liturgy is the enactment of the biblical narrative in a way that deeply forms the body of Christ. We do not have to make worship political by speaking about policies or necessarily trying to make it political. It's just political in of itself. That's because it points to a kingdom, with a king with specific ethics in mind. Since God has acted in history to liberate his people and build a new kingdom, our political theology must be weighed against his saving acts through the history of Israel and the church of the New Testament. And in order for a political theology to be properly Christian, it must be focused on adhering to the reign of God. Because we're in a kingdom, right? Christ has been shown as king in the event of his ascension, and all political authority has been subjected to him. Smith warns that what begins as a gospel-motivated concern for justice can turn into a naturalized fixation on justice in which God never appears. We must never let justice become an idol and forget about the particularity of Christ. The church is the agent in which society is shown the significance of Christ's kingdom. Because it is unique. Only Christ is king. And the church does this through its participation in institutions like the sacraments. And in baptism, we're incorporated into a new family. And when we take communion, we're instituting a kingdom reality that Christ is coming back. But since Christ did come to heal the entire world, church should concern itself with matters of justice. We take the realities that we now understand from worship to the rest of society in our everyday lives. So it's not just a a Sunday thing, but if, if we're truly being political, that means that what happens on Sunday are institutions that point to that kingdom reality will be will be seen throughout our everyday life. The shalom that God seeks to bring is only correctly attained when the transcendent Son urges us to want more from the world we already have. And I think, for the most part, the Smith's survey on the church as a polis is very accurate. I agree that, that with Smith's assessment of the importance of worship. And since we were created for worship, we'll find ourselves worshiping whether we recognize it or not. I think that's the case. If you're interested in another book of his, he's written a book called You Are What You Love. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of it. it won a few awards in the past few years. I saw an article that said it was the most important book of the last five years. On uh, I think it might have been Christianity Today or something like that. Um, so this this concept of that we are worshiping people and that it forms us, um, it's seen in that book. And I, I agree. And since we were created for worship, that's the whole reason for our existence is to, to love and admire God and be loved by Him. We'll find ourselves worshiping if we recognize it or not. And I also agree that the kingdom of God is inherently political. The kingdom has its own set of ethics from Scripture. <clears throat> Just taking a close look at the Sermon on the Mount in the book of Matthew reveals that Christ has taught something new. A deeper, more extensive reality. The extensive morality the citizens of the kingdom of God are to adhere to. I also thought of 1 Corinthians 6, 9-10, when it says, Or do you not know that the righteous, <clears throat> that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor adulterers, nor 
idolaters, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. So this kingdom, it has its own set of ethics. The kingdom orients our sense of right and wrong. And this law of our kingdom is written on our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. I also agree with Smith's discussion on the particularity of Christ's kingdom. While other faiths may have truth to share, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And the ultimate goal of the kingdom of God is salvation of all people. That leads to the consummation of all things. Only Christ can accomplish this task. Likewise, only those who are found in Christ will sit at his table once final judgment comes. And this shows that the church should be willing to recognize God's truth in many forms, but we should recognize that ultimately Christ is the true vine. We only find ultimate truth in him. And I also agree with Smith's claim that worship is an effective tool in ensuring the body of Christ practices ethics and points to Christ our King. Liturgy is crafted intentionally to transform the worshiping community. This is true. But my question for Smith is, why isn't this working? In America, a large percentage of people are in church every Sunday, but our nation does not uphold justice or follow the teachings of Christ. Divorce rates, pornography addiction, poverty numbers are practically the same for regular church attenders than those who aren't affiliated with any religious organization. Is the solution to have more people in worship? Perhaps the, the congregants are worshiping incorrectly, or they're worshiping idols instead of Christ. And I would first argue that worship needs to be even more intentional. Smith said that worshiping is inherently political since we proclaim Christ as king, but I think it needs to be explicit in order to have the correct effect on people. Church leaders must ensure that the pure word of God is being preached. Christians should have an adequate understanding of what the kingdom of God is. Pastors should be explicit in explaining the reality in the sermon and beyond. Smith places a large emphasis on weekly worship for good reason, but I don't think meeting to worship on a Sunday is enough for the church to understand this kingdom reality that Smith is describing. I think the history of catechesis sheds light on the importance of formal instruction of theological ideas, the morals of the church, and how to participate in the everyday life of the kingdom of God. The practices of the early church in Acts 2 seems more like discipleship groups than our Sunday morning corporate worship services. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. And it's in these moments of fellowship and intentional instruction that teaching can occur. Questions are asked, relationships are formed, and people are incorporated into the family of the church, and they receive a new identity as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. This is why the Reformation, Reformational leaders wrote catechetical manuals to guarantee that all new Christians were exposed to biblical truth and proper theology. It's in these times of confirmation groups and, and things like that where Christians should learn to think politically to weigh policies against God's word in a group setting. And when talking about the kingdom of God, it's also important to recognize that Christ's message of the kingdom is also political in the sense that it's good news to the poor. This is especially evident in the Gospel of Luke. A main feature of this gospel is that Christ is bringing good news to the poor and left out. A New Testament scholar, Brendan Bryan, writes, Jesus when he reached out to the marginalized in society, described in the gospel, foreshadows the reaching out on a wider scale when Acts tells how, impelled by the same spirit, the apostles spread his message beyond Israel, Judea, Samaria, Asia Minor, and Greece, ultimately to the ends of the earth. He's consistently bringing hope and support to those that are in need. And this call to bring the message of good news to the brokenhearted and needy is the same for us who claim to be a part of this kingdom. The Beatitudes in Luke are not spiritualized as they are in Matthew. And this reveals that the kingdom of God is concerned not only for the ethical and spiritual, but the physical 
as well. Any mention of the kingdom without acknowledging what Christ came, acknowledging that Christ came bringing good news to the poor is incomplete. As so that's sort of my survey of the chapter, I think it was a, a very good chapter, but a more comprehensive discussion might have been beneficial, but we can't <clears throat> hold them to too high of standards because we can only write so much in a book. Uh, but I hope that this um, sort of shed some light on the Smith chapter, um, and I'd love to, to talk with you about any questions you have.